SpaceX's launch pad at Starbase has finally reawakened. They just performed some tornado tests on the orbital launch mount. This is in fact the test of the Raptor QD. Let's see how high the vortex reaches. This test of the startup system is meant for the outer 20 Raptor engines which have been completely replaced after the Starship inaugural flight test. Aside from that, over the past week, SpaceX has been making quick work out of installing large prefabricated components for the Starship OLM transpirationally cooled steel plates. The pipelines are then also immediately put into the coupling. It's hard to tell for sure, but it appears that everything pictured has at least been lifted into place and surely welding has begun. Can you believe it? Starbase is moving so fast now. Remember when they were just pouring concrete 10 days ago? But what's more impressive, SpaceX has even started testing on this platform. Let's hear the majestic sounds over at Starbase. Although it's not the roar of the Raptor engine as usual, this is no less dramatic, right? More specifically, on Wednesday, the company conducted some sort of purge test on the high-pressure gas system for the water deluge system. That is an impressive amount of air pressure. They're probably purging any FODs, or foreign object and debris, from the system as well as testing the systems without water to see how it fares. Now let's consider this in a real launch. That's about 15 seconds worth of nitrogen pressure at full force, not counting the drop off at the end. That should take care of the 8 to 10 seconds or so of Raptors firing on the OLM before clamp release. And if you're wondering why there's nitrogen here, SpaceX employs a blend of water and gaseous nitrogen to effectively deprive flames of the oxygen necessary for their combustion. This method helps prevent the accumulation of oxygen and methane, thereby mitigating getting the formation of an explosive mixture within the launch pad area. By eliminating the presence of these combustible elements, the risk of accidental ignition is significantly reduced. The combination of water and nitrogen in this system ensures a safer environment by minimizing the potential for fire and explosion hazards. By employing this method, explosive gas mixtures can be rapidly neutralized beneath the launch pad, swiftly extinguishing any remaining fires. Shifting our focus back to the water deluge system test, this act actually isn't the first time. On Friday, May 19th, SpaceX released a 20-second video demonstrating that it is already conducting tests on technology aimed at fortifying the ground beneath its enormous Starship rocket's orbital launch pad. The footage of the test shows a methane-fueled Raptor engine ignited with its beam hitting a steel plate and a massive stream of water. One hell of a plasma beam, said Musk when he shared the video via Twitter shown here. A single Raptor version 2 engine is capable of generating around 230 tons of thrust. Engineers must build a strong structure that could support such intense power, since all 33 Raptor engines generate collectively over 17 million pounds of thrust. That will probably be tested soon, hopefully later this month. Could that be possible? And then the second Starship orbital flight will come next. Nope, that still depends a lot on the launch license. SpaceX and the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration are seeking to dismiss a lawsuit brought by a coalition of environmental groups according to media reports. The lawsuit was filed in the aftermath of the first ever launch of SpaceX's fully stacked Starship vehicle, which occurred April 20th from the company's Starbase site in South Texas. The lawsuit calls on the FAA to write up an Environmental Impact Statement, or an EIS, for Starship activities at Starbase, which is a more complete review of the project than the agency has conducted to date. Such an action, if implemented, could delay Starship's development considerably, as the vehicle would not be able to fly again until the EIS was finished. But both SpaceX and the FAA are pushing back, filing paperwork to dismiss the suit. In a filing on June 30th, the FAA wrote that the groups that brought the lawsuit lack legal standing for their claims. Separately, a SpaceX filing said the first Starship launch on April 20th provided no cause for the FAA to conduct a new environmental assessment, a process that could halt further test launches for years, the outlet added. SpaceX is working to strengthen the orbital launch pad at Starbase so it won't break apart again during Starship launches, which is what happened on April 20th. The company is also making well over a thousand changes to the vehicle in advance of its next launch, which could come within the next month or so, according to founder and CEO Elon Musk, provided there are no regulatory hurdles to clear. We're wishing all the best to SpaceX and, I can't believe I'm saying this, the FAA.
NASA, meanwhile, just got new Artemis Astro vans to arrive for use by moonbound crews. Canoe Technologies on Tuesday, July 11th delivered three specially designed fully electric crew transportation vehicles, or CTVs, to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The new trio of Astro vans will enter service as soon as late 2024, when the four astronauts assigned to NASA's Artemis II mission launch on the first crewed mission to fly around the moon in more than 50 years years. I have no doubt everyone who sees these new vehicles will feel the same sense of pride I have for this next endeavor of crewed Artemis missions, said Charlie Blackwell Thompson, NASA's Artemis launch director in a statement. Canoe based the new NASA crew transports on its LV or lifestyle vehicle, which the company describes as having a multi-purpose platform to maximize cabin space, utility, and productivity on a compact footprint. The three vehicles can carry four astronauts in their Orion and crew survival system pressure suits and support personnel, including a suit technician, as well as have the room for specialized equipment for the trip from Kennedy's Neil A. Armstrong operations and checkout buildings to Complex 39B, where the crew space launch system rocket and Orion spacecraft will be poised for liftoff. Externally, the new Artemis vehicles appear to be somewhat of a cross between the library of the Apollo astronaut transfer van with the sleek outline of the shuttle-era Airstream only with a more modern look accentuated by their street view windows and panoramic glass roofs. Many of the design aspects from the interior and exterior markings to the color of the vehicles to the wheel wells were chosen by a team that included Blackwell Thompson and members of NASA's astronaut office at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Canoe, which bills itself as an advanced mobility company, was awarded the contract to manufacture the three vehicles in April of 2022. The collaboration between Canoe and our NASA representatives focused on the crew's safety and comfort on the way to the pad, Blackwell Thompson said. For its part, Canoe Chairman and CEO Tony Aquila said his company was proud to be a partner with NASA in one of the world's greatest endeavors. The selection of our innovative technologies by NASA to take a diverse team of astronauts to the moon showcases a great commitment to sustainable transportation. We are inspired by NASA's pioneering and trailblazing spirit, said Aquila in a statement. The Canoe CTVs join a new generation of astrovans that includes SpaceX's fleet of Tesla Model X electric cars used to transport Dragon crews and a customized Airstream that will take astronauts flying on Boeing's Starliner to the launch pad. The Apollo and Space Shuttle era vans are now on display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex in the Apollo slash Saturn V Center and Space Shuttle Atlantis exhibit, respectively. Ahead of being used by Artemis II crew members Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, and Christina Koch of NASA and Jeremy Hansen of the Canadian Space Agency, the new CT TV fleet will be used for astronaut training exercises at Kennedy Space Center. The three vehicles will then be used for future missions that will explore the moon's south pole or visit the gateway in lunar orbit, beginning with Artemis 3, which NASA, following the White House's direction, has said will land the first woman and first person of color on the moon. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below because everyone's support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you so much and we hope to see you again next time.